I'm going to um, start by um, sharing my screen and talking to you about like the past uh, four years, uh, what I have been doing and mainly like my research, uh, the way the research take form uh, or different forms um and how i kind of like you know go through and navigate let's say uh different um, uh, collaborative collaborations but also different you know ways of um yeah producing uh, knowledge so um let me just uh, share my screen so um and check if everything is working so here Okay. And okay. So I think you should see something now, an image. Yes. Okay. Yes, we see a photograph of four persons sitting on a couch yeah exactly so um i would actually like to start by um by saying that what i've been working on for the past four years comes out of a decision to sort of like get away from a specific uh, aesthetic and cultural uh, discourse uh, that was always departing from or this this was the way I was um, researching and um, trying to think about uh, politics actually through a like a um, um, yeah like through a material such as you know like a magazine or a collection of magazine or architecture as an object so I wanted to kind of like make a detour and that started maybe in 2017. And I will talk a little bit about how this was actually um, triggered or how this whole process started. Um, and as, I, as I'm saying, like, I wanted to sort of like get away from a very specific aesthetic and cultural discourse that was departing from a um, specific cultural uh, object such as um, as I said, like a magazine or an architectural object. Um, and here I'm referring to two um, main and large projects I worked on uh, before 2017, which were uh, one research through Al Hilal uh, magazine, which is a uh, magazine that was published in Egypt. Um, and I worked on the collection from the 50s and uh, the 60s, which was particularly dealing with questions of, um, you know, like a uh, kind of a uh, third world alliance and also like um, pan-Arabism, um, a um, kind of like a, uh, um, a future, a socialist uh, future. Um, so I, this, this is what I'm uh, referring to when I say like a cultural object. And architectural object, I also worked a lot on the history of modern architecture in, um, in Lebanon, actually, and how this kind of like an idea of a universal, um, um, you know, like a, a architectural object, whether housing or uh, other, was uh, sent around the world, adapted, adopted, and, you know, like uh, also, um, resisted and vandalized, transformed, etc. Uh, so in order to think about um, its production and um, its history, so th that was my aim. I wanted to really think about like the production and the history of um, this uh, kind of cultural object, but I always entered this from an aesthetic perspective. So um, or um, even like a history of culture perspective. So always departing from this aesthetic question in order to look at the politics and taking into consideration the politics of image and of aesthetics production themselves. So not only politics with a, you know, like a, a big P. Um, 
so I wanted maybe to do an opposite move with this journey that I started. Let's say I give it a date just, you know, for not to get too, um, um, yeah, like too lost. But of course, I mean, I had started thinking about this since like 2015. Uh, but yeah, I started like seriously going into this um, research in 2017. And um, so, as I said, I wanted to do like a, a kind of an opposite move in this journey and wanted to start from the politics in order to go towards the aesthetic and form. So I wanted to look at what actual political organizations produce in terms of culture. So not the other way around. So how does like a, a political movement actually produce aesthetics and culture and form? Uh, so for example, um, I mean, this, this is like um, one question that was, you know, like a thread throughout the research. So to look at how a feminist political project with a communal vision takes form in space or what shape the organization of labor takes or the economic organization or the re relation to land and its maintenance. So what kind of form does those, um, uh, yeah, like movements or organizations take? Uh, so here I'm of course like making a clear distinction between and, you know, like making a dividing line between uh, you know, like a yeah, politics and aesthetics, but I'm just doing, and I know that things are much more intertwined and this is not like, there is no like, you know, this kind of binary separation, but um, I'm doing this just for the sake of, you know, thinking about like this opposite move that happened uh, in my work. Um, and I will also like, I would like to talk a little bit more later about uh, what is actually my position as a researcher and as an artist uh, in relation to all the different um, organizations, movements, co-ops, and um, you know, like a, um, a communes that I have worked with along the way. Um, and I would like to also like end with some self-reflexive note on uh, and the question about what one can do from within the art economy, because at the end of the day, this is where I am working and this is like um, where I'm kind of like from where I'm um, producing uh, my work. So um, I think that it's important also to have this kind of like self-reflexive um, yeah, like a self-reflexive um, moment in regards to this, um, where one is working from, from within which economy and what um, are the limits of that, especially if one is working with, um, you know, like political movements and organizations, communes, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so, one of the important questions in regards to that is how one relates to larger struggles from the distance, from this distanced uh, position, but also how one acts in this distance and this gap. So, of course, we acknowledge that there is this distance. So uh, you will see I'm not, of course, like part of the movements that um, I uh, worked with. But um, in fact, I, of course, like acknowledge very clearly and transparently this distance and then um, overcome this distance by thinking how can one actually act um, uh, within this distance in order to think about questions of alliance and um, questions of uh, solidarity as well, and even questions sometimes of partisanship. So how can one, you know, learn from the um, movements and the organizations um, and then also like take position as well. So all these questions really um, came out in this research journey, but also um, they are crucial questions, I think, to, to, to understand 
this relationship between aesthetics and politics. So they are really important questions as well as this acknowledgement, as I said earlier, of how uh, one can, um, you know, like uh, um, actually um, understand from where they are working, from where they are acting, uh, from which economy and what does this entail as well. Um, so there is a lot of, of course, like contradictions and imperfections in this whole process. Uh, and I will try to, um, yeah, like I think the, the work answer a lot of these questions, but at the same time also um, shows how contradictory and, you know, like um, very, um, let's say, um, not perfect or imperfect this process is. Um, and, you know, once like you step into this kind of like a research or like a, a kind of a research journey, let's say, you start working with other people and especially when it is, uh, it has to do with uh, a politics, uh, you are already stepping on a very muddy ground. And this uh, muddy ground is always like, um, can be explosive sometimes. Sometimes it can go really against you and against like your uh, good intentions, let's say. Uh, and um, sometimes, I mean, it, the, it is very uh, shaky and muddy uh, and it is full of, um, you know, like contradictions and paradoxes. So um, at, some point I also, um, you know, acknowledged that and sort of like um, understood that there is no uh, resolution actually, and there is no like a solution to that. So there is no like, you know, um, kind of a, a straightforward um, response or answer to um, that. And I think that things will, and I also accepted that things cannot be resolved actually in this process. So this is something that um, I will also uh, try to um, talk about. But I will first of all start just to give you an idea of this, also like a map of this journey. I will start in the mountains of uh, Kandil uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan and move to the south of uh, Tolima in uh, Colombia. So uh, the image that you see here um, in front of you is um, image that um, was is taken from it's still from uh, Who's Afraid of Ideology Part One, which is like the first film in the series Who's Afraid of Ideology, and um, I'm here sitting with uh, Pelchin. Um, I don't know if you see my cursor, but uh, she's the one who is, who has like a, a broken uh, leg. Uh, and she is a guerrilla fighter and a um, yeah like a, a writer as well. Um, she's one of the ideologues of the one of many, but um, also like an important thinker and ideologue of the autonomous women's movement, the Kurdish autonomous women's movement. And she wrote a lot on uh, ecology actually and the ecological paradigm in the movement. Um, and for me, that was fascinating because she is writing from a position, uh, from her position as a guerrilla, a woman in uh, the mountains. Uh, and this is like a, um, a very like a intense war situation. So how can actually the question of ecology come out of uh, such a, a situation? Um, and she writes a lot about that, and in her writing, it's very clear that there is a very strong uh, relationship with the landscape that she is actually fighting for. So um, the landscape in the mountain is, um, yeah, like a yeah, that uh, in the Kandil mountain in Iraqi uh, Kurdistan is at the border with Turkey and Iran, and it is a um, yeah. A war zone, um, and so, um, and at the same time, it is where like the guerrillas have their, um, let's say, like their headquarters. Um, so, she's um, so she's writing in Turkish and in Kurdish in both languages, 
but in 2016, I uh, invited two members of uh, the movement, Meral and Dilar, to come to Beirut uh, to do a reading group uh, on her writing. And for this occasion, they translated uh, some of her texts, which was like uh, amazing, actually. Um, and we did a reading group on, on that. And then um, afterwards, um, they told me, the, like, uh, you know, they said, maybe you should now come and visit us in the mountains. Um, and you could then meet Pelshin and talk to her directly. And of course, I accepted the invitation and went um, in, that was like in 2017. So here in the image, you see us uh, discussing one of uh, Pelshin's um, texts. Uh, and Meral, who's sitting to the left, is uh, actually uh, translating. Uh, and of course, like we sat for hours and hours, you know, like um, talking about her writing, her uh, the idea of how one develops uh, ecological, um, you know, thinking from within a militarized and a uh, war zone, um, and. Um, we understood as well how like war is the uh, very condition of a uh, ecolo the ecological paradigm. Um, and actually, you know, like, of course, what they're fighting against is a kind of a commodification of land and the privatization of land, amongst other things, by, uh, you know, like colonial states. Um, so there is like a kind of a, of course, a decolonial uh, fight, but uh, you understand that also the fight is, um, you know, not only for the land as such and the land as something that is, um, could be uh, potentially privatized and decommodified and uh, sorry, and commodified and, uh, you know, like owned. So the land becomes like a, a property. But the fight is actually for the very knowledge of this land and to be able to kind of like transmit this knowledge to uh, the next generations. And this is something that I really uh, understood. So that relationship between, um, you know, like a um, art struggle and knowledge as well. So a kind of like the armed struggle is uh, there not only to you know liberate the land as such but also to kind of like liberate uh, uh, the possibility or open the possibility for the transmission of a, um, a knowledge actually to transmission to others to next generations etc uh, and this is really clear in her very acute knowledge of the fauna and flora and the landscape and you know like that intimacy and that very close relationship to the landscape um yeah allows her to um, sort of like um also think about and open space for a new paradigm that is a paradigm that is an uh, ecological paradigm that is not actually uh, about, you know, only a kind of a, uh, um, yeah, have, living a better life or an, a, an ecological paradigm that is not, let's say, like an urban middle class idea of ecology, but rather an ecological paradigm that is, um, yeah, that is like a related to, um, of course, like the knowledge, the land, but the land that is already, um, um, how do you say, like uh, the land that is already um, um, disputed. Um, and so, yeah, and so from there, um, so in order to reappropriate land and take it outside of nation state formation, because this is their project, so a kind of like a, separ a separatist project, project, sorry, this can only be done through an armed struggle. And then you understand really the importance of their armed struggle. And that is part of the ecology slash war contradiction, the ecology of struggle against state colonialism, 
or colonialism that takes the form of a state if one um you know like um if one thinks about in the case of uh, kurdistan that it is a uh, kind of colonized uh, land from different states so like the syrian the turkish the um uh, iranian um so I need to move to the ah uh, here. Do you see the yeah? So yeah, um, this is another uh, still also from Who's Afraid of Ideology Part One. And I thought that I would like to show you since you maybe most of you don't know uh, or haven't seen the work, it would be useful maybe to show you a short excerpt of uh, Who's Afraid of Ideology. Uh, part one. So here, um, do you see that I changed screen or I have to stop sharing and come back? I think you have to, I don't know, but I still see the snow image. Uh, okay, okay. So <clears throat> yeah, now I see like an interior with windows. Yeah. Okay, uh, fantastic. Um, I will show you a short excerpt and then I come back. We are not outside observers of the world, nor are we simply located at particular places in the world. Rather, we are part of the world in its ongoing intra-activity. This is a point Niels Bohr tried to get at in his insistence that our epistemology must take account of the fact that we are a part of that nature we seek to understand. Unfortunately, however, he cuts short important post-humanist implications of this insight in his ultimately humanist- Our, I think the image froze. Ah, okay. We can hear the, we can hear the voiceover, but uh, the image is still the illustration, the botanical illustration. Ah, okay. And it only says it's like uh, 11th second of the video. Ah, okay, so but the sound was good. Okay, so I stop sharing and I share again. Sorry, I don't know what the problem is. Uh, yeah, well, it happens. Let's see. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I can see a different image now. It seems better. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's try. See. Does it work? Yeah. We are not outside observers of the world. Nor are we simply located at particular places in the world. Rather, we are part of the world in its ongoing intra-activity. This is a point Niels Bohr tried to get at in his insistence that our epistemology must take account of the fact that we are a part of that nature we seek to understand. Unfortunately, however, he cuts short important post-humanist implications of this insight in his ultimately humanist understanding of the weak. Vicky Kirby eloquently articulates this important post-humanist point. I'm trying to complicate the locability of human identity as a here and now, an enclosed and finished product the causal force upon nature, or even as something within nature. I don't want the human to be in nature as if nature is a container. If I say this is nature itself, 
an expression that usually denotes a prescriptive essentialism, and that's why we avoid it. I've actually animated this itself and even suggested that thinking isn't the other of nature. Nature performs itself differently. She said, I want to point out something about my personal experience. I remember my childhood. My first ecological teacher was my mother because my mother taught me that we as humans have a place in the nature like the tree, the bird, and I have the right to exist like all other species at the same, at the same time and in the same place. You shouldn't hurt the earth. You should protect the tree. Don't eat meat. Don't kill the animals. But we, we are children of the 20th and 21st century. So it took a long time until this philosophy reached us. But these things got transmitted by my mother and they are the sign of this old philosophy. In the guerrilla, we developed a new philosophy. We were for three years in the mountains of Dersim. Biz işte 40 kadın arkadaş bir araya geldik. Uh, 40 women we came together. Kendi başımıza kalıyorduk. Uh, we were staying together on, on our own. Herkes alone. aramızda bir saat mesafe vardı. There Dağlarda tabii. There was a distance of one hour walk between us and the man. Tabii her zaman saldırı olan, olasılığı olan bir süreç. Uh, it was a time when there was always the risk to be attacked. Hepimiz yeniydik. Bir we all were olmuştu. new in the mountains, maybe one year. Dağdan da korkuyorduk. Ayıdan da korkuyorduk. And we were also da afraid da of the mountains, for example, of birds, of snakes, things like that. E, ama e, biz o zaman e, 40 kadın arkadaş e, tek başımıza kaldığımızda aynı zamanda bizden çalınan bütün güçleri de farkına vardık. But when we stayed 40, as 40 women together in a place, we realized also all these things that were stolen from us. Mesela biz bir ay boyunca bir sürü odun çektik erkeklerle birlikte. For example, one month we were um, only carrying a, a lot of wooden together with the men also. Bir yere topladık böyle üst üste attık. Uh, we put it on one place together, you know, all, on a... Ama onları hani baltayla kırıp götürme zamanı gelince. But when it was the time to break them to make them small. Biz balta kullanmayı bilmiyorduk. We didn't know how to use the axe. Although we were collecting this wooden. İşte o anda birçok arkadaş dedi ki Allah bu annemin babamın belasını versin niye bana balta kullanıyor dedi. <gülüyor> In this situation a lot of our female friends were saying you know they got angry with their mothers and their fathers they said why did not why didn't they show us to use this ex? İlk öğreneceğimiz şey balta kullanmak. And we said the first thing uh, to learn would be to use the ex. <gülüyor> Öğrenene kadar buralarımız hepsi yarı oldu bir ay içinde. And until we learned it within one month we got a lot of uh, you know wound, wounds here. <gülüyor> Ama öğrendik tabii birçok şey gibi. Uh, we learned it, like a lot of things. The mountains have always been um, a very strong um, protector uh, of the people who have been historically persecuted. Also, when in 2014, ISIS attacked uh, the Yazidis, for example, the first thing that the people did was to flee to the mountains. People have always understood how to live together with um, nature. I know this, for example, from my own uh, grandparents' village, how they live and interact with nature. They have a very different relationship to the animals that they raise, a very different relationship. They sing songs to the mountain, not about the mountain. And I think ma many, many different cultures, groups, um, 
indigenous peoples have this kind of relationship with nature, which is very much a comradeship, you can say it's a friendship rather than an alliance. Yani mesela ben çocukluğumu hatırlıyorum. I remember my childhood. Hı-hı. İşte annem mesela hani benim için ben öyle derste öyle söyledim hani benim ekolojik öğretmenim ilk öğretmenim annemdir. My first ecological teacher was my mother. Çünkü hani bize çocukluğumuzdan beri işte hani bu doğada hani biz insan da yaşıyor bir kuş da yaşıyor işte bir ne bileyim hani bir kedi de yaşıyor bir böcek de yaşıyor bir ağaç da yaşıyor hepsinin benim kadar bir insan kadar bu doğada hakkı var ve yaşam yeri var yani. Because what my mother taught me when I was a child was uh, we as a human uh, have a place in the nature uh, like for example a bird or uh, let's say uh, a cat or uh, a tree. Uh, and I as a human have the same right to exist inside this nature like all the other things. They all have the same place. When we look at the universe itself about how um, ecologies work, how um, environments work, how Uh, beings, existences uh, interact with each other, they do so um, not necessarily in this social Darwinistic um, concept of um, competition and the survival of the fittest and destroying the other, but uh, ecology is always based on interaction, on um, mutualism, on, if you will, cooperation, if we want to use human terms in order to um, interpret uh, ecology. If we look at the situation today, we can say that Each member of the of the movement has a certain uh, consciousness about ecology, and this was developed within the conditions of war. If we look at... Okay, so maybe I stop sharing, go back to the, and then um, share screen again. So um, yeah, so the, I, I just wanted to show you this excerpt to also like, um, um, yeah, like here, um, Pelshin, so one of the uh, people that are speaking is uh, Pelshin, uh, but also to, um, you know, like show you as well how I dealt with this question of the distance and of course also like of Uh, you know, like uh, me being the person who is listening and learning um, and also like a, a kind of a uh, mediator between, you know, their knowledge and um, the outside world or like the world that, that does not know or like the people who do not know their knowledge. So it's, there is like a kind of a mediation uh, role that I had as a, uh, an artist and a researcher and a filmmaker. Um, but uh, yeah, but I also like wanted to show you that it was very clear what kind of, you know, like a position I had. And of course, you know, I was mostly listening, learning and uh, kind of a, yeah. Uh, and also, of course, like um, we understand better how Um, the their voices are actually you know like coming out of this these uh, nature shots uh, but also understand better their kind of like a, a very um, intimate relationship with uh, with the land and with nature and um, their idea of what uh, nature is and that's what I also meant when uh, I said that they're like sort of like um, the struggle is about being able to transmit the knowledge that they have of that place. Um, so not about like a, an ownership of the land itself. So this is something that is interesting to keep in mind. So after I, uh, you know, like I went to, I was in the, the mountains and I uh, kind of like I uh, produced this uh, short film Um, and I showed it to them actually, and uh, yeah, they kind of liked it, and uh, they proposed to me to go to um, to the um, north of Syria, uh, where there is a uh, women-only village uh, that is, you know, that was at the time when I went being built um, and uh, you know uh, inhabited as well. So people, uh, women, started like living in it. 
Um, uh, and actually, so after the 2011 uh, uh, Syrian revolution and the uprising in Syria, there was a moment, a vacuum where uh, the defense, the Syrian um, army or defense forces were pushed out of the north of Syria, so like the Kurdish area. Uh, and there was a moment where there was a kind of a power vacuum, let's say, and a, a reappropriation of lands. So there is a lot of, I, I think, 85% of the land is like public land, so uh, uh, belongs to the state and it's agricultural land. Um, a lot of it was reappropriated and uh, some of it was given to the um, uh, autonomous women's movement to build uh, agricultural cooperatives and to also like uh, build a commune like this one, like this woman village. Uh, that is a commune uh, where women only, only women live. Uh, and they are uh, mostly like um, women who are, let's say, uh, running away from um, either uh, like, uh, the patriarchal institution, either like their, I don't know, fathers, um, husbands, uh, brothers, etc. Or they do not want to actually marry, like, you know, they do not want to enter a kind of way. Uh, and of course, the choices are a little bit limited. So it is a kind of a, uh, a ref refuge for them. But also there is like a women academy there. There are kids that are, you know, living, there is a school, etc. So I'm showing you this image and this is a still from Who's Afraid of Ideology Part 2. Uh, I'm showing you this image. Uh, it's like a, a kind of a map of the area uh, that is an official map. Uh, and it's like a gridded, uh, you know, like a... Um, uh, uh, organized uh, map and um, this is what this was like the proposal of the village which was to build this kind of like a circular um, architecture so the commune is uh, here you can see it uh, it's these houses that face each other uh, and in the middle there is like a common um, you know kitchen and space and there is like a big garden um, and so um, that was like a very interesting moment because um, all these like ideas and theories, if you like, that I had learned about in the mountains were sort of applied there um, and implemented as such in practice. Um, and it was really interesting to see how the, all these like ecological ideas like relationship to the land, relationship to knowledge, relationship to plants, to uh, living together. Uh, so that, uh, you know, like a ecology that goes beyond, you know, like a understanding of ecology that is limited to environment or like sort of like save, saving the environment, et cetera, but more a, a, a life that is, um, you know, um, fully uh, ecological in the sense of also like the social relations. Uh, and that is um, that was like a really uh, interesting um, way to think about also the relationship of theory to practice and how actually you know like these uh, theory are um, uh, are practiced. Um, and I don't know if we have a moment and I can show you also like a short clip to give you a a, a better uh, idea of uh, you know also what, I'm talking about here, and you will see the difference between, um, yeah, like between um, the between the like more um, like uh, let's say like the um, theoretical talk and the ideolo ideologues of the movement, and actually the uh, women that are living in the village. So I, I quickly show you like an excerpt. Uh, I will run through just uh, for you to see the um, how the village looks like from the inside. Sorry, I skipped that. So,
عندنا الارض شوكي يلي هو بيطلع مثل بيشبه كثير للاجر العصفوره بس بيطلع بقلبه هو ماده بالارض شوي بيفرش بالارض تفريش بحجمه صغير بيطلع بقلبه كوز هذا الكوز بعدين من كوز الشوك يفتح وبيصير لونه موف من البدايه لونه اصفر هذا للزنطري كثير مهم ويستعمل كمان كدواء من نوع من الزهره كدواء يعني يعني اذا ناوي تجري لداخل منه بالناس ناوي ياخذ داخلهم يعني اه وين تبقى؟ اها يعني نكتب الفورمات؟ اه يعني بسكر عدالات از بيجيم اصلا عدالات يخو قلتي اخش خو بيري جي عايده جي وقته اه اه اه مثلا اخش بيري وقت دولت عايده دولتكو بغصب عايده دولتكو باشكال عايده دولتكو يعني سردم اخي يعني أخ بخ بر دبلة مندي بر جمركي ده ده هل كنتي ما في أخي فلسفة ما مثلا كردان ده أبهية تبي سرب أخي ما في مورجيه ما في تشوكشيه ما في مارجيه ما في إنسانجيه ما في غورجيه أما يك إنسان تي در دوري في قفط كده بيب عيد منه I will skip just um, maybe you can get to know some of the women who live there. Yeah, I Okay. <laughs> يعني هالسنة طب أكثر هالسنة خلاص إيه مسكنا محرجنا بس أنت جاي الله ويعلم باقي بعد يلا رجال روح هلا لا يركام رجل هون سنت جاي ما تلاقي ولا واحد غير النساء بس So there is also the school. Yes, I just um, uh, I just show you like um, a final maybe uh, excerpts. Um, ما تشوفوا جمر بينا شو بس نفسه مدي لا يشيل يا صام بدر يلا هرمي لي هر قلمي وبلبي 
Ete bunu otur, potek çeyit gene. Aki, aki. Sağ da bu. Ujatan dersen. E, Kurdistan'a ulu bu, ulu bu, bu potek gene. Hele. Dibar dayı, dibar dayı, dibar dayı. Tüm sen beni kim hayat dışı kalastım ha. Müdele gidem kısır yok. Adı sen bir şey mori bu kombi zeynin. Abi Kurdistan ya ulu. Abi çok güzel. Baş bu tuhaf bu kombi. Hayat akmet çeyim. Hoşça. Nasıl bu meri gidin ya karak. Ne ne? Maşma taşıyor mu masma? Beli. Eşer gözü yarım götüne çok gözü yarım. Eşer cem tarım aldı. خبر آبی دی سوژه نیست ری داده گری دو آمپا کشیده ناگری مزدی الله از خوبی دوباره کشیده آوره بی داره میگیش بدارن لذیذ حیان بدی از خوب ای از دنیای نمادت کرد میانه او او چلو بکشیده ناگر یکشی تهات جنوب ایدنا یعنی او حیات برد آبی آبی پاش هر رو منوی شرط کیر هر رو خراب نتانی نکری آخانی ندا از هیدا قحری ولا أبال الوادي اللي ماني من دبها كيف أخوارم بال فيدا مستغرق كيف وقت يجي نه يكون دعوة كرين نه نه أهوا ذكرين نه سروا عنك قدو أزار تدري أزار تقول يكون دعوة تمولي ولا إحنا بنغيره ولا okay um maybe just to move to the the final geography um, I share my screen again. Um, so yeah, so this is, um, as you heard uh, from the different uh, women as well, like this refuge, this like place where, you know, everyone is kind of let's say, let's call it running, running away from uh, certain forms, uh, different forms of a patriarchy. Um, and in the case of, um, so yeah, so this, this is also like the way, um, um, yeah, like it was uh, quite amazing to witness this kind of like uh, uh, implementation, let's say, and implementation and you know, it, it's not like an A to B, of course, like a very linear, um sort of a thing that is happening but this kind of like these ideas uh, around the question of ecology that are you know taking form uh, also architecturally architecturally spatially but also uh, in the like social relations um uh, in in that village um and um yeah so le let's go let's move on to the south of uh, Colombia and uh, maybe before we go there um, in June 2019 uh, I organized this convention of women farmers and ecological feminists uh, at the Warsaw uh, Biennial and it was like a whole full three days um, and uh, in fact uh, some women from the uh, autonomous women's movement the Kurdish autonomous women's movement were there and uh, some women from the south of Tolima, from Colombia, from Chiapas, uh, from, um, yeah, like a uh, different parts of uh, Poland, as well as a, a, a, um, a farm, like a queer a farm from uh, Germany, from Brandenburg. So there was like a, um, a different, uh, you know, like uh, uh, women from um, uh, all over. Uh, also from Lebanon, uh, so from the uh, kind of like different uh, geographies uh, and um, together with so like all these uh, people that are actually involved in um, organizations and also like scholars, uh, ecological feminist theorists and uh, scientists, lawyers, uh, so it was a kind of a bringing together all these different forms of uh, knowledges and practices to talk about uh, ideas and strategies of uh, deprivatization of land, communalization of land, a, um, also like uh, um, talking about their specific strategies. So for example, uh, the women from uh, Tolima, from the south of Tolima, 
they were um, all of them seed guardians. So this was uh, sort of like their, um, you know, uh, strategy to reclaim and reappropriate land. So uh, Claudina and Merci from the south of Tolima uh, came there from the Pihau uh, indigenous community, and they have been dealing with this seed guarding or like seed saving and um, and not actually preserving uh, because um, the whole idea of uh, saving or like uh, guarding the seed is to plant it again and then you know it kind of like gives more seeds that could be planted again so it's not the idea of it's against this idea of uh, you know building a seed bank but rather uh, um, like letting freeing the seeds so it's an opposite so uh, an, an opposite um, idea of accumulation. So it's against this uh, accumulation or accumulative processes and uh, bank uh, sort of like uh, institutions and banks and corporations that uh, want to like a uh, kind of uh, take uh, uh, own the seeds as uh, uh, their property and intellectual uh, property and you know like label it as their intellectual. Uh, property for commercial purposes. So um, I then I was then again like invited. They saw the the film I did in um, uh, Kurdistan and was invited by them by like the um, uh, Mercy and Claudina from the south of Tolima to visit them there. And um, I would like to um, show you an excerpt of uh, of that film. Um, just uh, running through images of the convention. So you see like the, um, you know, what kind of situation we were in. Um, there was like one day that was actually um, closed uh, to the audience. So it was only us and um, uh, two days that were with audiences like in this situation here. Um, so yeah, so maybe I can show you a uh, final uh, excerpt um, from that a film that I did in the south of Tolima. Um, and here it is. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk after that. When a crime happens, often the delineation is drawn around the corpse at the marker of the space where the corpse fell. But the effect of the fallen corpse on the soil spreads much wider than the delineated point of fall. It is unseen at first glance. It can be perhaps seen under the microscopic lens. The earth remembers this fall. It is a question of material remembering, the way the body has affected the soil, the way soil changes after having received a dead body. In fact, this concussion is undelineable if one wants to think in terms of chemical encounter between the corpse and the earth. What enters the body and what goes out of it is uncalculable in terms of earth body encounter. The bacterial formations that travel between the body and the soil are invisible, but not only. If one thinks of a body as a bacterial mass, one stops thinking about its borders, so the human bodily mass becomes undistinct from its environment, and more precisely, 
from its non-human environment, the soil, plants, bacteria, and seeds. I'm going to also skip through. Básicamente se, se dieron cuenta o, o llegaron a la conclusión de que las semillas están mejor andando todo el tiempo. Y andando es que se estén sembrando, que se estén produciendo y no guardadas, porque también guardadas pues es, es como y recaen sobre prácticas de acumulación también, que es contra lo que se está luchando, porque la misma acumulación es lo que nos ha llevado a tener estos problemas de tierra, de agua, ¿sí? de, en todos los sentidos, la acumulación de... de de algo genera pues que alguien no lo tenga. Acá, mamita, muchos años, mucho tiempo, los gobernadores han luchado esa parte y nos, por allá él viene y nos informa y dice que ya, que el otro año, pero es el momento que no ha llegado y está el gobernador gestionando a ver qué pasa porque realmente todas las comunidades más con resguardo, entonces, pero nosotros no. Ha sido por la recuperación de las tierras, porque estas tierras que eran de indígenas fueron entregadas a terratenientes y ahorita nos tocó organizarlos como, como comunidades indígenas para hacer la recuperación nuevamente. Con las semillas, si usted protege acá en su finca, ¿cómo le hacen resistencia, digamos, al avance de la caña, de todas estas problemáticas que hay en el territorio? La caña. Y que los vecinos alrededor también sean firmes, que no se vayan sacando, sacándolo a uno ahí de rápido. Que hace esta de acá que siempre caño, caña, que siempre hay siempre caña, que uno queda encerrado, que está ahí encerrado, tiene que salir. Pero entonces yo no tengo esa idea de salir de aquí. Ok. I'm gonna come back. Um, yeah, maybe it's a good moment to open up if there is any questions, but yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, yeah, it's, it was really maybe interesting and important to, um, I mean, I was, I, I went there at um, February, 2019 and I was supposed to go back, uh, sorry, 2020. And I was supposed to uh, go back uh, and, you know, like um, expand on this film, but this did not happen because of COVID, obviously. And I did not uh, go back there. Um, and I uh, also like started working on an actual communalization of the land. So this is what I am doing at the moment. Um, so there's a whole process working with a lawyer and a historian an agronomist and a geologist to uh, actually uh, make a case on like communalizing a land. 
departing from the fact that land as a living object cannot be fully you know appropriated but also digging into like a, a, a historical laws that could be reactivated so bringing together like philosophy and history geology agronomy etc uh, and um, yeah so i did not go back uh, to uh, um, colombia yet to south of tolima uh, but it's uh, really interesting to uh, see how, like, actually, the uh, this little, you know, seed could actually be so threatening to, you know, authorities, corporations, etc., and how these women that are guarding the seeds become a threat, and they are actually uh, often, um, you know, like eliminated, murdered, um, you know, like uh, um, expelled from their territory, etc. So it is a very violent, again, like a violent uh, conflict, uh, but it's, um, of course, like quite um, shocking how like it's such a little, um, you know, a seed that is crucial uh, for survival uh, can um, be such a huge threat. Um, yeah, so that was like an, an interesting um, uh, or like an important thing uh, to note. Uh, so yeah, so I tried to like map a little bit this research journey and also like clarify my position and what we could from an artist's position and an art economy actually do or not and the limitations of that. So how things fall apart also very quickly, like for example, with this convention, we wanted to do another iteration of the convention, continue meeting, etc. Uh, and create a kind of a network of people that would be, uh, you know, working on deprivatizing of, uh, and communalization of land. But did, this did not um, happen um, because of COVID, of course, but also because we don't have the means as such. And uh, so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's really important to see also like the limits of this, uh, what you can do from that space of the art or uh, that economy. Um, yeah, I don't know if there is any questions or uh, yeah, like comments or um, so that maybe would be a good moment to uh, open up. I would like to ask how, like, what is the uh, the focus point of your uh, research that you do uh, within the PhD? Um, um, uh, yeah. I, I know that you're doing a PhD project, if this somehow is directly uh, related or... Yeah, yeah, so this is directly related. So it is in relation to this question of feminist politics and uh, land struggles. Uh, but uh, yeah, also there is a, the question of film. And in the PhD th thesis, I talk about very specific film sequence. So how to actually film uh, land and uh, you know like a yeah uh, in uh, land in in relation to a violent history or like a violent conflict or so how can one actually approach this and film and is it at all possible and of course there is also this question of filming as ownership as well so it's another uh, you know apparatus for um, like surveying for a uh, kind of a uh, owning for um, you know accumulating uh, as well as um, yeah it was it has been historically an apparatus of uh, like a parallel to or like a, a part of a, a, a colonial explorations so how can one actually deal with that uh, differently um, and I try in the films to always have this apparatus uh, very visible and uh, you know like a articulate that but I'm trying to also like more than this try to like think about um, different ways of uh, producing a, a image um, um, yeah like which, which would be more collective ways and more um, maybe like a um, I don't know uh, ecological ways in terms of like uh, consumption of images um, but yeah that's like a long-term process and I don't think I have uh, reached that yet uh, but this question comes in um, yeah a lot in the 
and in the uh, thinking and in the research. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask something, but it's okay, okay, okay. Uh, so what kind of collaborators are needed when investigating and how to get inside to when you like uh, investigating the con uh, countries and the village? Yeah, uh, yeah, this is, a, I think, a crucial question because it is really based on long term relationships, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it is ba based on long term re relationship and trust as well. So, like, uh, for example, before going to uh, the mountains to Iraqi Kurdistan, I actually was, um, yeah, like I, I invited. Um, members to Beirut, like my hometown where I used to live. Uh, and um, we did this like um, a reading group. So we started like this kind of relationship through the text of Pelshin, the guerrilla woman that I talked about. And so um, it's quite, I think, important to, um, as, I mean, it's, it's crucial and the core these relations that I have, that they are really friendships, actually. So um, it's, uh, um, um, and I'm often uh, invited and I invite people. So I, I think it's uh, like a mutual kind of uh, guesting and hosting uh, because um, it's not at all based on a um, sort of, um, um you know like um need like a temporary need of something but more like this long-term um friendship and also somehow alliance as mm -hmm. well political alliance so i think that i have been like also part of different uh, feminist uh, organizations and i think that i have learned this kind of you know um um, building long, like building alliances from there and mm -hmm. how you actually uh, build these alliances and what kind of exchange as well in these alliances happen. So for example, when I was, uh, when I showed the film to, um, you know, like the members of the movement, they proposed to me to go. And so it's also like coming from them, not only a, from my, desire so it's not like mm -hmm. of course it's like a mutual desire to you know do something together um so it's always yeah like building like these long-term relationship and trust and um as well as a finding a common desire and a common you know ground to do things together um and i also work a lot in general with other people uh, and I think that I'm, I like to work on long term even like with people we edit the film with and the uh, people that are filming that are shooting um, they are like the same and um, it's like a way of working that I find um, that I have built throughout you know the years where you kind of like really um yeah like uh, build like a uh, um like very rooted uh, relations uh, in mm -hmm. that sense um yeah it doesn't mean that you don't disagree that there is not like fallouts that th this also is part of it but yeah this is like the um uh, ecosystem if you like of the work mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a quite important to um, build a, a an ecosystem for um, an ecosystem of for the work, but also for the production of any kind of knowledge that comes in dialogue with other people. So, mm -hmm. mm. thank you. It's so interesting. Yeah, I would like to ask you if you would like to comment on some observation um, I see when it comes to this like uh, especially this like the struggles of like reattaining indigenous land and also 
uh, reattaining like uh, identities that has been like put forth into uh, um, indigenous people that somehow it becomes this paradigm of the struggle, you know? And it's also something that's really hard to uh, fight out of, you know? I know from my own uh, friends, for example, um, that, that they say no to be invited to talks because they're only being invited to talks because the, the whole uh, idea behind the talk is to get all kind of point of views instead of actually find a solution, you know? So this kind of paradigm is, would you say it's super hard to break because it somehow have become a stuck paradigm somehow, you know, like it's like, it kind of cannot come out of this uh, position. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, if I understand your question correctly, um, I think that, um, first of all, uh, there is like a, um, a very clear um, position that, for example, I have towards, for, for example, like the autonomous women's movement or, uh, you know, like the um, um, uh, communities in the south of Tolima or uh, in other places. So I think that uh, the political position is uh, quite clear. So when, for example, I am kind of like um, inviting um, or like uh, organizing the convention, uh, it has a very specific purpose. And the purpose is to actually build a, a common, um, you know, like a if you like a, a, a common uh, conversation with all these different organizations and the different um, communes. Um, and it is a way, in a, in a way, I mean, um, it is not only about listening to um, the struggle itself and giving a kind of a, uh, a report on on the struggle and a kind of like a uh, let's say uh, a, a point of view it's a very uh, uh, clearly positioned uh, um, uh, yeah it's like a very clear position biased if you like uh, and at the same time it is um, maybe not a resolved solution but it has a kind of a an aim and the aim is to connect all these different struggles and try to start like mapping a, a, a or like charting a kind of ways of action uh, that could be common. So of course, in each one's locality, there are different strategies and, but these strategies you can learn from so much. Um, and this was, for example, um, just to give you like an idea of uh, the convention. So the, the idea is not for people to just come and talk and present and report and then there is no, um, yeah, as you said, like a, a resolution or solution uh, or like a proposal at least, but it's uh, uh, um, to sort of like build something up. So there is a very clear um, aim in that, uh, in that sense. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, I think that at the same time, of course, like these struggles are so located, but at the same time, they are also like so, uh, if, if we can say universal, not in a, uh, of course, like an, an enlightened way, but a, a, it, they are like international, if you like. Um, and uh, international in the sense of there is like a, uh, uh, internationalist kind of a, um, a drive to them um, because I think that in um, they are anti-colonial and um, of course like anti-colonial and anti-capitalist at core um, and of course like feminist and all of that but um, at, I think that the core of it is that they are actually um, yeah, like anti-colonial and anti-capitalist. Uh, and in that sense, I think that there is no, uh, a struggle is never really uh, resolved. So it's never really like something you find a solution to, and it's never something that you will come out of. 
it's not like okay now it's resolved we're we're finished uh, you know like we give a plot of land to uh, some communities and then they will you know uh, be happy and uh, capitals like uh, logic doesn't work like that there will always be and colonial logics that don't work and mechanisms don't work like that there will always be a kind of an expansion and a kind of a um, a, a kind of a uh, you know like a uh, um a, like ambition to and greed of course you know so um in, in a way i think that the aim for a solution out of a struggle is not a, a possibility i think the solution is only to accept that the struggle is not uh, resolved and to just continue and sometimes you have to like repeat a lot so like you have to say the same thing over and over again. And this is part of it. Um, so yeah, so in that sense, I and I have learned actually a lot from the autonomous women's movement on this point, as well as from like the different um, like Mercy, Claudina, Samantha, like all the women from um, the south of Tolima that um, it's not something that we have started. There is like a history, a struggle is historical uh, and nothing is a historical in that sense. So it's something that will came before us and will outlive us. And so when you are here, you are actually continuing something and opening something else for the future. And this is uh, what I actually take from uh, you know all these women at the end that um, not to say that you don't have an agency on the contrary you do have but this agency is historical and uh, it's conditioned and in that sense you have to uh, you can open something for the future but you are actually like carrying all these different struggles when you are you know continuing so thank you uh, so much yeah. it was a very perfect elaborate uh, answer and i really like this idea of like you can it's super hard to escape this like colonial uh, patterns that also come from it because i'm super interested that we can make something you know with the best of intentions you know but then we don't know how it will be, be perceived by other people you know in other countries if this is going to be shown in sweden for example and they will still have this colonial approach to everything that's outside of their own country will be perceived as this like old term of the exotic you know so that's mm -hmm. why i find it super interesting like that we can do things with good intentions but how would it actually be produced in other people's perceptions yeah yeah and that's a super hard thing to i, I can imagine like because one thing is to do it with the good intentions but also show it with good intentions and i like this idea of keep showing it because it's a continuous struggle you know and that's a very good strong statement yeah yeah but also i think that when you are producing something you're producing it with all these questions in mind and you know already that especially if you're producing a film or images you know already that this is going to be shown and i think that you're already have all these questions in mind that um who, who will it be shown to you know also like uh, how the audience will perceive it. Um, so these questions, I think, are part of the production itself. Uh, if you're like, like thinking critically um, on, you know, like uh, images and production and so, yeah.